<laughs> okay, let's let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and uh, boy, the time is just getting away from us as we think about the days and the weeks and the months of the calendar floating by, and as the years go by, um, it, it can certainly cause us to reflect on the, the passage of time and, and help us to reflect on our own time. We, we Lord, take each day as a gift from you. Uh, we don't know uh, what tomorrow will bring or next week or next month or even next year, but we trust in you, Lord, as you are the giver of all good things and you have provided this day for us. And so we know that you have blessings in store for us and things that you want us to accomplish. We ask, Lord, that we would always be guided by you and uh, help us to know how to fill our time. But, Lord, also help us to keep the greater perspective of we have this time here, but you have opened all eternity to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, as we number our days now, help us also to look forward to the coming uh, eternity, uh, that opportunity we have to share in your kingdom uh, without any of the the bad things of this world, the things that keep us awake at night, the things that cause us uh, great fear and worry. And so, Lord, help us to entrust all of those things to you, knowing that you will take them away uh, in, all, in, in due time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, handouts for everybody. There's some for you. Three on this side. That's four, I think. One, two, nope, you need one more. One for you. Ooh, um, all right. Everybody got one, and mm, there we go. Okay, so today uh, I kind of previewed it a, a little bit last week. I said uh, the first, tr first part of Mark chapter 7, it seems like it's really theological and um, kind of stuff that doesn't really apply to us much anymore today, um, especially the first part. The second part was a little bit more applicable. We talked about last week, um, but it kind of reached this conclusion of, so what comes from outside doesn't defile a person. It's what comes from inside. And we said, you know, if you really think about what Jesus said, um, he, he does away with the distinctions that the Jews were operating under of there were certain rules one could follow, and that made one clean to what Jesus said is, doesn't matter what rules you follow, we're all unclean because we all do these evil things. This is the sin in us that causes us to, to do these things. And, you know, we might soften it, of course, and say, well, we don't do all of those bad things. But um, again, even in God's eyes, the little things, it, it's... It's big enough. Um, again, you could look back to the Pharisees. It's a little thing, whether you wash your hands or not and whether you do it properly. Like, that's that's such a little thing. But to the Jews, to the Pharisees, that was a really big thing, and that's why they brought it up to Jesus, because this was no small thing. It's all important. Well, in God's eyes, all sin is, is sin. It doesn't really matter. But then it shifts from that perspective to Jesus dealing with people, again, that by the rules are unclean. They're outsiders. They're non-Jews. And so they don't believe in the right things. They don't do the right things. And they would be treated that way. But if you left the last reading, understanding that in God's eyes, really, all of us are unclean. All of us are outsiders. And so how does God deal with outsiders? Well, it's the way he deals with the Jews. Um, he tries to bring them all into the fold to hear his word and follow it. And he doesn't just want that for Jews. He wants that for all people because all of us in the end are outsiders. So the story today is about a foreigner, a Gentile woman, and G how Jesus deals with her. And it's, it's a complicated story because in the end, she gets what it is that she sought. What she wanted was her daughter was afflicted by a demon and that demon will be cast out. So just, you know, on the barest of surface, it, it, it looks like any other story. In the past, in the gospel, people brought to Jesus 
Um, they're sick, people who were afflicted by demons, and he healed them. But in general, all of those stories were about Jews, um, the, the good folks. And so here, the difference is this is among s someone who is not a Jew. And so the regular Jews would say, hey, Jesus, your, your behavior with that person should be different. You shouldn't act the same way with this one as you acted with all of us. They, they may not deserve your mercy, you, you know. Um, and this is one example of throughout the Gospels, there are many stories like this. And there will be a, a couple more as we continue. Um, and it helps to see in Jesus' own life what will come afterwards, especially through the Apostle Paul, is there is no Jew or Gentile. No, no, no male nor female. None of these distinctions really matter when we are in Christ. In Christ, there is this new kind of unity. Um, we are all one. We are all part of the body of Christ. And though there might be external differences, those external differences don't really matter. The most important thing that gives us our identity is being in Christ. Um, and again, God would have all people be saved. All people come to faith and knowledge of him. So, um, so on the outside, you see that happening. But the real difficulty of the story, if you can look beyond that, is just the way that the story happens and the conversation that this woman has with Jesus. Um, and it doesn't really go the way that I think anybody thinks that it should go, but... It's, it's Jesus, so we have to listen to him. You know, Pastor, sometimes I, I wonder why he doesn't want people to know. Mm -hmm. And other times it's okay. Yeah, well, this won't help any of that. Because <laughs> this story includes a lot of that. So let's get into it. We'll read it. We'll talk right. about it. Right. Yeah. Chapter uh, 7, verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Um, so he had just been with, uh, with Jewish people. So he's going away from there to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Um, if you have uh, access to the maps, uh, Tyre and Sidon are two cities along the coast um, of, of the Holy Land area. They're uh, in modern day today, like Syria and Lebanon. So like just as the, as the Galilee area is north of Jerusalem, Tyre and Sidon are west of Galilee. So you go north to the Galilee area and now go west straight to the Mediterranean Sea. And Tyre and Sidon are two cities along the Mediterranean coast. Um, on your map, I believe only Tyre was there. Is, oh, on, uh, Sidon, okay, yes. Yeah, Tyre's on, yeah, so Tyre's on, on one because Sidon is north of it. Yeah. So if you flip it over, you'll see Sidon is, is further north, but along the coast. These are not Jewish settlements. Um, Jews may have been in this area, but they would have been a very small minority. Um, this is definitely Gentile territory. These cities were originally um, of the Phoenician people. So uh, in some of the maps, you might see this area labeled Phoenicia. Um, the Phoenicians were uh, Greek people um, who were, were sea uh, going people. So again, that's why they're along the coast. Um, it would be a port where they would be going along the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in in the olden days, the the majority of seafaring people would generally go along the coasts. So you would hop sort of from one port to the other, and you would never really be too far away so that the coast was sort of still within distance. Um, you could travel across the Mediterranean Sea, like in open water. It's just that that was much more dangerous because open water against storms, um, you know, it, it's not that they didn't know how to navigate. Again, people back then, I think, generally were a lot smarter than we are today. Um, they, they do know how to navigate by the stars, by the sun, you know, east and west. So just keep the sun on either side of you if you want to go north and south. I mean, they could figure that out. But um, generally, if you're, if you're going along the sea to trade, you'd, you'd want to hit those port cities anyway. So it was to your interest to stay along 
along the port. So Tyre and Sidon have a much longer history um, through the Phoenicians and through trade. And so it would have been also a, a pretty cosmopolitan area filled with a lot of different kinds of people. That's not the type of place that Jews want to settle. They, they wanted to be among their own. Why would Jews be here, though? Remember, in the big scheme of history, um, the Jews have been taken over a couple of different times by Assyrians, by Babylonians, um, a little bit by Egypt even um, at times. And when that happened, they would often take prisoners into exile with them. Um, and generally, they would take the social elite um, the noble born, the rich, the powerful. And they would take those people because you, it's like a power vacuum. If you take them away from their land, the people are less likely to be able to reorganize, to stage a revolt and establish leadership again. So some of those people um, do end up in areas where they wouldn't necessarily have chosen to be because they were taken there as captives of war and exile. And eventually they just laid down roots there. Um, again, some of them would go back to the homeland, but hey, you know, we, we didn't choose to be here, but we're making the best of it. We've started a business and all of that. So they just stay there. So there could possibly be a Jewish population, but in this instance, we find that the people that he's encountering are not, are not Jews. So um, he's in a foreign area, Tyre and Sidon, and while he's in that area, he entered a house. Mark doesn't give us any more information about that. That's where you go, you wonder who, whose house is it? Um, did he go into a Gentile's house? That would have been pretty radical. Um, or would it have been, he, he found one of those Jewish families and, and they hosted him. Um, you know, we, we just don't know. But he, he stayed someplace. He's intending to be there for a little bit. It's not just a passing through kind of thing. Um, so, again, that's interesting. Jesus is in foreign territory, and he's not just trying to get out of there as fast as possible. He stays there. But here's the tension. He entered a house, but he, do he doesn't want anybody to know that he's there. Um, again, it it's, it's playing off of a couple of things. You would think, okay, he's in a non-Jewish area, non-Jewish people aren't really looking for Jesus anyway, are they? Because, again, who who is Jesus purporting to be? The Messiah, the one bringing the kingdom of God. Well, that means something to the Jews, but if you don't believe in that God, or you believe in many other gods, who, who really cares? But maybe they're not interested in all of the theology, and maybe they don't understand all of the theology, but... Jesus has enough of a report following him about the miracles that he does. And so it's that kind of thing of, hey, um, at the end of the day, again, if you're a pagan, somebody that believes in many different gods, well, hey, th this God happens to be doing stuff here. Doesn't matter if he's not one of my primary gods. You know, I believe that there's a spiritual realm out there and that spiritual realm, something's happening with this Jesus guy and he's healing people, and we have sick people, why not bring them to, to Jesus? So they're a little bit more open um, to all of this. Again, when you embrace a, a, an idea of polytheism, where you believe that there are a lot of gods, there's not really a problem with the Jews and their God. It's just one more God. The problem with the Jews is that they insist on monotheism. That's, that's where these different populations didn't get along because they're willing to grant the Jews that their God exists, but the Jews aren't willing to do the opposite. They, you know, they say your, your God isn't, isn't real, isn't powerful, that sort of thing. So that Jesus is in a foreign population, he's staying there for a while, and he doesn't want people to know, sort of says that even when Jesus is outside of the home territory of the Jews— People are interested in him. They're, they're, they're coming after him. Otherwise, it, you wouldn't have to say anything about he didn't, he didn't want anyone to know. I would probably suggest there's less of a influx of people here than there would have been among the Jews. Remember when he was traveling in Galilee, he couldn't even get on shore, and there was a huge crowd there. 
Um, so this is this is slightly different, but that it, it does go to Bob's point of okay, why doesn't he want people to know? But you have this conflict of look, if he really didn't want people to know, he wouldn't even gone there. So it's not a complete ignorant thing. Like he doesn't want people to be completely ignorant. It it is a not yet. He he doesn't want people to to know yet. And that does seem to explain some of this tension. And well, why doesn't he want them to know yet? Because they jump to the wrong conclusions. Because they misunderstand who he really is and what, what he's about. But he still has mercy on people. He doesn't want to completely shut up all of the miracles and all of the the teaching that he's done, but he doesn't want it to happen in a time that he hasn't ordained. You know, so uh, we we sort of put it to he knows what he's doing. We don't always understand it. Um, there 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 is a reason. But to us, you know, we're like, hey, get get as many um, people out there knowing about this as possible. And here it does appear again, he's going to do some things among the Gentiles. And so if everybody knew right away, it would have probably been just like in Galilee. His movement was restricted. He couldn't do the things that he wanted to do. Um, so we're just like two stories away from he is going to have an occasion where he's going to feed 4,000 Gentiles. So the same kind of things are going to happen where the crowds are going to overwhelm him. And again, he blesses them. He, he will do miracles for them in their presence. So it isn't a complete shutdown and, you know, I'm not going to have anything to do here. The, the worst reception that Jesus ever gave was to his hometown. Um, so you have to think about that. It wasn't among the Gentiles. It wasn't among, you know, the different places in Galilee. It was his hometown where he wouldn't stay there because they didn't even recognize him as a prophet. Um, so, again, our categories or the Jews' categories of this day of how you think Jesus would and should operate you would think that, A, he wouldn't even go among the Gentiles. But B, if he would, that he would have nothing for them, or if he would have anything for them, it would be words of, you know, again, looking down on them. And he, he does kind of offer that, so we'll have to get into his words. But um, the fact is, even though he didn't want anyone to know, he could not be hidden. Um, not with all the miracles he was doing. Yeah. Yeah, and and awesome. that 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 is sort of something about Jesus and his ministry that he tells people not to say anything, and they they say it anyway. Um, so what? Why did he even try to to shut it up? The good the good news was just too good. They couldn't wait to yeah. tell somebody. Yeah. So verse twenty five. Immediately, um, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. So he tries to stay hidden, can't be. We have this woman who shows up. Um, why does she show up? Well, she has a strong need. She has a little daughter who has an unclean spirit that is a demon, and she knows something about Jesus. Again, what is it that she heard? Apparently, the things that she heard were enough to think, oh, he, he could do something about my problem. So I'm sure she heard about the stories of him casting out demons, the stories of him healing people. Um, you know, these are all big, big things that would give her hope. Uh, but the question to me is, did she also hear that he was a Jew? Did, did she also hear that, you know, again, Jew, Jews and Gentiles don't mix? Um, was that enough to keep her away of like, oh, yeah, he does this, but... He only does it for his people. He, he, he doesn't do it for people like me. Did, did she hear or think about that? Or did she just think about her need and his power and his mercy? Um, we'll, we'll sort of wrestle with that. Um, she comes, she falls at his feet. 
this is a little interesting to me. Uh, in English, falling at falling at somebody's feet. There's a couple different Greek words and ideas that can be behind this, and they convey slightly different things. Um, so one phrase for falling at somebody's feet is a word that generally is translated as either bowing down at somebody's feet or falling in worship. Um, we, you know, prostrating oneself before another. And it's, it's always like in the context of, if, of, we would say worship, if it's not thought about in that, those terms, we would say great reverence. Um, it's recognizing that, that this person is just ha has a high, high standing. And it's, um, okay, the, the other word is, is it looks the same in the action, but it has a slightly different connotation. It's one who comes as a beggar. So in worshiping somebody, you're not necessarily asking them for anything. You're just recognizing their superiority, their higher standing versus what this is, is it's you're falling down because you want, you want something of somebody and it's like you're putting yourself completely at their mercy. Now those two ideas could overlap, but um, Mark does, ha does use them separately and demons um, fall down to Jesus in, in this worship pose because they recognize his ultimate superiority. And remember in the gospels, the demons are actually afraid of Jesus because they know that when, when God is there, like their time is up, that they're going to be sent to the abyss, they're going to be you know, forever destroyed. And so um, they, have, they have really no, no negotiating with Jesus, but they come and they, they see his superiority. They call him the son of God, the son of the most high. A, a suppliant, that is a beggar, um, obviously there's some understanding that the, the person has, has some higher ranking or some special power or authority, but you're really falling down before them because you want them to, to do you a favor. And so there, there is some question of this woman. Is she worshiping Jesus? Or is she asking a favor for him? And it's really, really hard to tell. And you can argue sort of both ways. If she's worshiping him, like that's really amazing. Again, because she's not a Jew and doesn't have the proper theological background to really get all of this. Um, but, it, but as a beggar, certainly, because she has a great need and she thinks Jesus could meet her need um and and you can do that as as anybody um it doesn't have to be a, a worshipful thing but um falling at one's feet there again they're kind of two ideas they could be separate they could be together um but there are different words in greek for each of them so falling prostrate before one in in an act of reverence versus falling prostrate at them as, as a beggar. Um, in, in the ancient world, this was a known pose. You would fall at somebody and like grasp their ankles. Um, that, that was an, and again, this, this is in a lot of different cultures, um, that pose was, was understood. Um, we in our world, you know, might have our own idea of like, what, what does it look like to, to beg somebody? And um, maybe for us, it's like falling at their knees you know, holding their knees or something like that. We're, we're less dirty than that. We don't, we don't get flat on the ground, but. Um, Didn't the people who went to Jesus only wanted stuff done for them to, for their well-being? Mm -hmm. It wasn't really to ask Jesus to enter their hearts and they would be followers of him. Mm -hmm. They just wanted something done. Um, so interestingly enough, this, this word is used um, in the story of the, uh, the demoniac among the tombs. Um, so go to my notes on this. Um, -da 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 -da. Where are we? Uh, I have a lot of... I have a lot of notes. I have a lot of notes because there's a lot of stuff. So it's the bottom of page two. 
Um, so these are the actual words that I, I threw here. So um, the paragraph at the bottom, the woman fell at Jesus' feet, that paragraph. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So one word, the, the reverence one, is proskineo in Greek. So that verb is used twice in Mark's gospel. One of them is of the man among the tombs that was afflicted by demons. And the other is um, soldiers who are mockingly paying homage to Jesus. Uh, so that, that man, remember, he wanted to be a follower of Jesus. He said, take me with you, basically. He wanted to be a disciple. Yeah. And Jesus said, no, you stay back. And again, he ends up telling people about what Jesus had what done. Jesus had um, yeah. So, uh, your your question of like, doesn't anybody ever fall fall in like, hey, you know, I, I want a relationship with you. I, I think that man there does that. And then the irony in Mark fifteen is that the soldiers do this in in mockery to him. Um, yeah, but the the asking a favor. Um, so I might, have, I might have confused it, so it's good that I got my notes in front of me. The demons are the ones who do this other term, uh, prospipto in, in Greek, and they ask a favor of Jesus. So send us into the pigs or, you know, hey, you know, don't, don't destroy us. Um, and the woman who touched the fringe of his clothing and the, Jesus said, hey, who touched me? And, you know, again, she was scared out of her mind. Um, but she she fell at his feet, um, not in worship. But hey, I I just came as I, I don't have any any anything that I can say in my defense. I just wanted your healing power, and um, please don't hurt me. Please don't take it away. Yeah. Um, so again, the 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 words in Greek tend to lend themselves more to she she didn't quite have the relationship. She just had the need and wanted Jesus to meet that need. To do something for her. Yeah, but as we see, I think it develops a little bit. Okay, so she begged him to cast the demon. Uh, nope, I skipped 26. <clears throat> the woman was a Gentile. Um, literally in Greek, she's a, a Hellene. She's a Greek woman. But again, to Jews, as long as you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So same, same difference. A Syrophoenician by birth. Again, I told you that these people um, who originally colonized this area were Phoenicians. Um, she's called a Syrophoenician because the Phoenicians basically colonized the entire Mediterranean Sea. Um, and so there's another area um, uh, where Phoenicians were known, but that area, uh, okay, Roman history time, does anybody remember the Carthage? Well, do you know anything about Roman history? Am I going to? Yes. Okay. Do you remember Carthage? Yes. Um, so ro- the Romans and Carthage fought terrible wars. They were called the Punic Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes Rome won, sometimes they didn't. But there was this famous mm-hmm. Roman statesman, Cato, mm-hmm. who said of the Carthaginians... Uh, um, must be destroyed. Exactly. Car- Carthago delenda est in Latin. Carthage must be destroyed. And eventually the Romans did win, and they um, sowed salt into their land so that the land would never produce crop. I mean, this this was that complete and total annihilation. If you want to destroy somebody, you got to go all out. Otherwise, they'll just continue to be these minor skirmishes and wars. Um so the Phoenicians were originally the people that settled that area. And so that's another group, the African um, Phoenicians. So these were called the Syrophoenicians because this was this branch of the Phoenicians. There's a, another one that would have been known as this African um, part of part. Syria. Well, it's what today is modern was be, would be modern day Syria, but Syria comes from this. This area is known as Syria, so they're the Syrian Phoenicians or the Syrophoenicians. Um, again, for our purposes, the big point is it establishes this woman as a foreigner. However, it starts to it starts to ring a little bit of bells because. Um, there's a famous woman in history who would have been connected to this whole area, um, and her name was Jezebel. 
She became a queen in Israel because she married King Ahab. And so it's just lighting up a lot of things that, again, from a Jewish perspective, like, okay, she's a foreigner. Like, nope, no, she's not a foreigner. She's from the stock of Jezebel. Um, Jezebel's like the worst woman in Old Testament times. Um, She was an enemy of the prophet Elijah. And after Elijah had that contest on Mount Carmel, um, where, hey, you guys worship your false gods and I'll worship mine and we'll see which one answers. And again, God is the one that answers. And then all of the prophets of Baal run, um, run away. And Jezebel is so ticked off that she says, I'm not you know, I will not rest until Elijah is dead. And then Elijah runs, 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 runs all the way back to Mount Sinai um, and says, God, what were you thinking? Like, I did this and now I, I'm the only one left and they want me dead. And again, God says, no, there, there are still people here. Um, you need to go back. And eventually Jezebel is, is killed in a very um, barbaric way, um, eaten by dogs, I believe. Um, so... Jezebel's like the worst of the worst. All that baggage is sort of triggered when you hear of a woman coming from this area, a Phoenician woman. Um, So none of this would lend any mercy or compassion in that day to her. And, And so again, I think Mark tells us all of these things so that we know how amazing is God's grace, how amazing it is that Jesus would even have a conversation with her, um, let alone heal her daughter. Okay, she begged him, uh, that is Jesus, to cast the demon out of her daughter. And Jesus said to her, let the little children be, or let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Mm -hmm. All right, so what does that mean? Um, Here's an instance, unmarked, I think, that we could call Jesus' response to this woman is a parable, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't go out and say anything. You have to figure out what, what did he say. However, you have to grant that the overall tone of these words is not a, oh, my dear woman, your daughter, I, of course I will heal her, right? Um, so this is that picture of Jesus, right? He, want, he, he goes to a foreign place, but he doesn't want people to know them. Here's a woman who asks this favor of Jesus, and he, he kind of is pushing her away um, just because he doesn't immediately grant it. But look at the words that he says. Let the children be fed first. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Pretty obvious. Is is he calling her a dog? She's he's certainly not calling her a child, right? You're not one of the children. You're an outsider. That that would have been obvious to everybody. You're not in the household. You don't belong. What are you doing here? Why are you asking something of me? Um, you know, but if you want to make this like a lot worse, you certainly can. In the Old Testament, dogs, so we have to undo our thinking about dogs. Dogs are cute, cuddly creatures. You want one as a pet, you know, it's man's best friend. In in that day, dogs are unclean animals um, because they're scavengers, right? They're gonna go dig up the dead thing and, you know, roll around in it and do all that stuff. And if they come into contact with that and then you cuddle them, now you're unclean. Remember, it's contagious. So dogs, are not good animals. And in the Bible, again, I I listed a few references um, for you in your uh, handout on page uh, four. Dogs are associated associated with really bad people, outsiders, people that don't belong in the kingdom. So 2 Samuel 16 is at the top of page four. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? And he's talking about a person. So calling them a, a dead dog is like, don't even listen to this guy. He's, he's a nobody. Let me go over and take off his head. Um, so uh, again, you don't say dead dog. You don't call somebody a dog that you are on good terms with. It's, we don't even want this person. Um, psalm twenty-two, sixteen, which is a uh, prophetic psalm, 
um, that is usually thought of as a psalm that describes Jesus' own crucifixion. Um, we read it in our congregation on Monday, Thursday evening um, at the end of the service as we strip the altar. Um, but in, in Psalm 22, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. Hebrew poetry uh, uses parallelism as one of its poetic techniques. Parallelism is you repeat words or ideas and they're synonymous. So dogs encompass me is set on parallel with a company of evildoers encircles me. So encompass, encircle, evildoers, dogs. So it's not talking about literal dogs being there. It's talking about the evildoers. So it's a derogatory term of, of a wicked kind of person. Um, Philippians 3.2. So this carries over again, even to the New Testament. Paul writes, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And so again, this is parallelism. He says the same thing three times, but it's, it's different types of people. He's not warning people to stay away from literal dogs. It's the people that Paul was talking about would bring back circumcision and therefore a gospel that is no gospel at all. Um, and so he's warning them against um, her heresy, the, the wrong kind of theology. So when Jesus utters that word, and it seems to be in reference to this person, um, it's really, really offensive. Um, in, in modern day language, we have a word for a female dog. It's a very offensive word. Begins with a B. Uh, stop, yep. <laughs> we, we know the word. It's that level of offensiveness is, is sort of like in the water here. Now, here's the problem though, or interpreting. We don't know the tone of voice, you know, and tone carries a lot. So we don't know the tone of voice that he says this. So that could perhaps soften the words, but we still have to say these are hard words. The second thing is that Jesus uses a word for dog. He doesn't use the, the word like for an adult dog. He uses what's known as a, diminu a diminutive form, which would like be translated as like a puppy or a little doggy. And so that could soften it a little bit. Um, but there's, there's a problem in the Greek language at this point in time is that the way that you make a word diminutive, um, it, it was starting to lose effect and force at this time. So it just didn't necessarily always have that connotation. And so it's, it's not clear. All of this is to say is that commentators and scholars look at this this line of Jesus, and we don't really know how to read it. Like, it sure seems really offensive. How offensive is a question we don't really know, but there is potentially some softening of it, but it's still offensive. It's still not Jesus just saying, of course, your, your little daughter is, is, of course I'm going to come. Of course I'm going to cast out this demon. And that's a really hard perspective of Jesus. What do you do with this kind of Jesus? Um, again, you know, we encourage everybody to, whatever it is that's on your heart or mind, bring it to the Lord in prayer because he hears our prayers and he answers them. But you read a story like this and like, well, how does he hear my prayers? If he hears my prayers like the pleas of this woman, I don't think I want to pray to that God. I don't think I want, you know, Jesus to rebuff me like he, he's re rebuffed this woman. Um, it's, it's a really challenging perspective of who Jesus is. But on the other hand, maybe it was a t also a test to see just how strong motivated she was okay. and how interested uh, and how much she believed yeah. in him. Yes, and so that would be the, the other side of, hey, even our prayers to, to God we are very clear, God is not your magic genie. He is not here to grant your wishes. And so, yes, there are times that we pray and we pray fervently, you know, with, with complete faith and he doesn't answer the prayer in the way that we want. Um, 
it is a test of a sort of will you still love that God? Will you still trust in that God even though you didn't get the thing that you wanted? Or it wasn't good for you. Right. And, well, yeah, again, the the more the divine perspective of that that we believe that God doesn't give things that are harmful to us. And so we look at the response and say, hey, no, that was harmful. My, my loved one died. That really hurt God. But from God's perspective, he, he's doing something more. We can't see it. We can't understand it right now. But, but there is a big perspective, and he is doing something more. But again, all of that comes from a great maturity of faith. Um, well, how do you get to be somebody who's immature in your faith to somebody who's mature in your faith? How do you grow in your faith? Testing. The, these, t- these times of testing where you, you find out what your faith is really made of, what it is that you really do believe about God. So if you go away from God, you know, completely heartbroken because he didn't answer that prayer and you really, really wanted that thing to happen and you thought that that was good for you, um, you now have to look internally and, and look back to God and, and say, who, who are you, God, and who do I believe you are, and am I willing to believe in this type of God? Um, now, I think you would ask, what did I do wrong? That, and, but that would show what you believe about God, mm-hmm. right? Well, that, that God only gives things to me if I'm good enough. So that would be a testing of your faith. And I would say we want that kind of test, that faith to be tested, because that's not the solid gold. That's chaff. Um, God does not deal with us according to our behavior. If he did, we'd, we're all in trouble. But for this statement, it may go your way, which means mm-hmm. God approves of it, that her daughter would be healed. Well, you, you jumped way, way ahead. We're not there no. yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, you usually slow us down. Now you're trying to speed us up. Um, well, the clock is, you know. Yeah, right? So I started us off. This is, a, this is a parable. What is it that Jesus means here? That's what needs to be answered. And this is a parable where we don't have the disciples right there to ask Jesus, what in the world did you mean by that? Um, and the amazing thing is, You almost don't need it because this woman basically decodes the parable and yet uses the parable still to continue her inquiry, her request of Jesus. So um, listen to her answer. She answered him, yes, Lord. So she grants the premise of the whole thing. Yes, the children ought to be fed first before the dogs. Okay, uh, you know, I, I agree. And in granting that, she sort of grants that assumption about her own status. I may not be a child. I mean, I may not be in the family. I might just be a dog. But, she says, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So, yes, the dogs don't belong at the table. They don't, be- they don't get the main course. But, but the dogs are happy enough just to get the little things that fall. And <clears throat> again, you, you, her response is a parable. So you do have to, uh, to go any further in this, have to say, what just happened in all of this? So on page five, I kind of have the sort of the decoding of the parable. So page five, it's bullet points there. It's a just over the halfway mark at the top of the page. So what did that parable mean? What did Jesus's words mean? Who are these people? Well, the children would seem to represent uh, those in the family. In other words, from the Jewish perspective, all of the Jews. Um, What is the bread? The bread is whatever satisfies people's basic needs. What does it mean to have one's fill, to have one's needs met? What are the the dogs, the puppies, or whatever of the story? They're those who are not truly family members. In other words, in the people groups, they're the Gentiles. They're the outsiders. So what does it mean to take the bread and give it to the dogs? It means to give what is needed to those not truly in the family before the children have had all their needs met. So the full understanding of this woman's words 
she's saying the Gentiles will receive the blessings of the eschatological reign and rule of God. In other words, the kingdom of God, what, what it is that Jesus has come. And in Jesus, they will receive them now. So again, this is about the kingdom of God and the Messiah and the Jews are the chosen people. They're the family. So it's, it's right to go to the family first before going to others. Even Jesus' own words is not precluding going to the dogs, going to the Gentiles. And God's whole plan of salvation always has been to include all people. But he starts with the Jews and the Jews, it will go outward. Just like later on, it will start with the apostles and it will go outward. The plan is always to include all people. God is never a, yep, I like those people, I don't want those people. Um, the Jews understood the history of their people that way at times, but that was never God's plan. There's a priority, but not an exclusivity, okay? So that's what Jesus said, first to the children, but this woman, she was upsetting that order. Because Jesus' ministry to the Jews wasn't done yet. He, he still had more to do. And so it seemed like she was cutting in line. And so he said, hey, don't, don't you understand? I, 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 my work is still not done. I, I can't, you know, do, do your thing. But she butts in line and says, you can still do your thing. We'll, we'll, I'll just take the leftovers. I'll just take the, the little bits. And again, if you think about this, her faith is, is showing here. So if at first she is just somebody asking a request, she's saying, even a crumb from you, that will satisfy me. So the children, they might be getting a full course meal, but a dog will take a crumb and will be more than happy. And that's all she wants. She doesn't want his priority just a little bit from you is, is enough. And um, again, to think about, make this more personal, personal um, if we pray like that to God, you know, hey, I, I, don't, I, don't, need, I don't need everything from you. Uh, I just need a crumb because your crumb is more than enough for me. Um, That's don't, true, true today. I mean, this yeah. place is going to the dogs. Yeah, you know? yeah. You're going to the dogs. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, it's it's this small interchange, and it and it's really hard to interpret because it is all in a parable, and there isn't any real decoding. But we see by the interactions, you know, what's what's sort of happening, and um, it's it's kind of like the story of um, Jacob wrestling with God, um, and. Remember, they're like in this battle and they fight all night and Jacob won't let the angel, God, go until he blesses him. And this woman's like, I won't let you push me away until you bless me, uh, until you show mercy to me. Um, and again, I don't think that's our typical way of thinking about our relationship with God. We, we just think like, oh, you know, again, God just gives, gives, gives. But sometimes he wants us to grab a hold of and, and take or to demand from him. Um, and again, there are parts in the Bible where this happens. Moses. So Moses is leading the Israelites and they just don't get it. And God says, forget the Israelites, Moses. I'll just take you. I'll make a nation out of you. And Moses prays to God and he says, no, you won't. Because if you did that, all of the world would see this is how you treat your people, that you just abandon them. So you will follow your word to make these people your, your own people. Um, and we're like, Whoa, man, Moses. That's heavy. Um, but what is he doing? He's taking God's own promises and he, he's, he's saying to God, I understand your character. I understand what it is you want. And you can't do that because this is who you are. Um, and, and so sometimes I think in, in our faith life, that, that wrestling with God is, is a real thing. 
And I think it is part of the testing and the maturity of our faith. But it's hard to explain to somebody who doesn't really have a relationship with God because they're like, wait a second, like, is this God for me or against me? Because I read a story like this and I'm not really sure. Um, I, I like the other miracles where he just freely, you know, he does, you know, hey, a, as you wish, um, you, your, your faith has saved you and, and just sort of says, says, says the easy things. That brings up a question. When Moses said to God, mm-hmm. you know, these are your people and that stuff, yeah. does that mean God was just testing him? Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I mean, it's the open, it's the open question. We don't, we don't really uh, know because he passed the test, so to speak. Um, but you could look at a different example of Jonah to the Ninevites. Yeah. He failed the test yeah. and, and God didn't, A, he didn't get rid of Jonah because he still wanted them, him to go to the Ninevites to preach repentance and, they, and they yeah. repented. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I put it in the, 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 the very broad category of we can never put God in a box. Um, and so they, Yes, God is a is a loving God, a generous. He's our heavenly Father, and He welcomes us in His arms. But the Lord also disciplines His children, and and sometimes that doesn't fit into my picture of God. Well, God wouldn't do that. That's not very nice. Well, God's not worried about being nice. He's worried about your salvation, um, and and so sometimes He will do things that we would say are testing us yeah, or are disciplining we're us. Stupid enough to test Him. Well, yes, yeah. Um, yeah. So that interchange between this this woman and Jesus is is the thing that makes this, again, on the outside, oh, Jesus goes to a woman, heals her daughter, you know, casts out the demon. Yeah, that's just a regular story. If you didn't have this interchange, it would be. With this interchange, this is a really challenging story and really says something about our own faith life and God and his disposition to us. Um, because just like your question with Moses, um, Bob, what if the woman didn't respond in this way? You know, what if she just walked away and said, oh, he doesn't care about me. Um, again, we never, we don't know because that's not the way the story ended. Jesus knew this woman and what he ended up doing was changing this from I start to, I'm not sure she knows much about Jesus. Now I say, she's like one of the few who understands Jesus. So he drew out of her this deep faith. Um, She knew her status as a Gentile, but she knew God's mercy. And a little bit from God was more than satisfying to her. I I don't know if I read it or or heard it somewhere, but... Before the earth was even made, mm-hmm. God knew what we were doing today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because God stands outside of time and he's omniscient. Un- and unbelievable. Almost, yeah. You know? But I also think a mother with a sick child, mm-hmm. maybe she was dying or mm-hmm. whatever was wrong with her. She had a demon, demon, oh, but yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, but a mother will never stop. Mm-hmm. And Jesus knew that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you would, I mean, I'm just speaking myself as yeah. a mother. If, if all of a sudden my child, something was going to happen to them and I had the choice for it to happen to me, I would ask for it to happen to me. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're focusing on Jesus, but we also have to focus on the woman being so, I'm going to do this for my daughter no mm-hmm. matter what he says. Mm-hmm. That I don't think even if she didn't have the right answer, she might not have tried again for mm-hmm. another answer. She mm-hmm. would have kept trying. Mm-hmm. It's There's remarkable, people. the women that occur in, in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they really are outstanding. Yeah. So, again, to even uh, amplify that, remember there's there's been this thing that's been said about the disciples lately that they don't understand, that they're not getting it, that they're not getting it. Not only is the, the picture of Jesus sometimes challenging in the Gospels, the picture of the disciples is also not what you would think. So, you know, I, I would say, if, if we're looking at people, if you want to see a greater um, example of faith, don't look to the disciples. This, this woman, has sh- her faith is exemplary to us. Um, not the disciples' faith like we would think, 
not the ones that Jesus chose first, but this one who followed and pursued after. Um, all right. Well, we'll uh, say just a few more words next time when we come back, but um, we'll we'll move along. And again, there's going to be another Gentile story and another Gentile story. And chapter eight's kind of the turning point of the gospel. So before they reach the turning point, it's like you're basically seeing deja vu. So there is that priority. First, Jesus did go to the Jews, but now he does also go to the Gentiles. So we see events being repeated now. Just like he cast out demons for the Jews, now he's going to do it for the Gentiles. Just like he heals for the Jews, he's going to do it for the Gentiles. Just like he fed 5,000 of the Jews, he's going to feed 4,000 of the Gentiles. Jesus is the same to, to both of them. All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, what a... Uh, confounding story uh, of Jesus's encounter with this Syrophoenician woman that we read today. And, and yet, Lord, there's, there is so much here for us to see about the nature of faith and uh, our own needs and how they can drive us to um, just uh, this place where we have nowhere else to go, but we seek you, Lord, because we know who you are and we know what you are about. We know that there is salvation in no one else. There is no hope to be found anywhere else. And so, Lord, we do pray that uh, you would, through your Holy Spirit, work in us the same kind of faith as this woman, um, that, that we would seek and pursue, pursue you above all other things, and that there would not be anything that could um, distract us. There couldn't be anything that would uh, diminish our faith, our trust in you, but rather when those things come that would test us, when things come that might... Um, potentially turn us away, that we would push those things away and pull even closer to you, Lord, even as we know you draw close to us. Um, help us, Lord, in those circumstances, in those times when we feel um, rejected, when we feel like our pleas haven't been heard. Help us in those times when our faith is being tested or when we are being disciplined to really look back to you at the center of all things and to see your love, your grace, and your mercy. And help us to deal with other people, Lord, who are in similar um, circumstances, who feel hopeless in this world, who feel like there is nowhere else that they can turn. And help us to have the words and have the heart and compassion to help point them to you, who hears and answers all of our cries. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.